Hello, friends. Uh, welcome to the 2017 Global Dialogue on Waste. Since 2013, we've uh, brought more than uh, 150 practitioners and thought leaders from around the world um, to disseminate knowledge um, on waste. And um, this knowledge would otherwise be confined to uh, long PDF reports or to paywall websites or to um, uh, expensive international conferences. So, um, and um, today, um, as for the interview, we have um, Crystal Molart, who's the director of ISFAG. Um, ISFAG is a waste management company in uh, Belgium. And um, ISFAG has been a very strong supporter of uh, Be Waste Wise uh, and communications in the waste management from the very beginning. So uh, thank you very much um, for the support. And um, because of their support, uh, we wanted to understand, you know, why they were supporting us and, you know, why they um, care about communications and waste management, which, which is why we have Crystal here today with us. Um, my name is uh, Ranjit Anepu. I'm a co-founder of Be Waste Wise. And um, today uh, with Crystal, we'll be talking about um, uh, gaining uh, community trust. I mean, in this age today, um, people are losing um, trust in governments and institutions. And in, in, such a, uh, in, such a, in such a time, we wanted to find out how a waste management company and that to a waste to energy company uh, uh, generally uh, deals with community trust and you know how how it engages with um, its community stakeholders. Um, the, the reason we're looking at it is um, every uh, waste management facility, whether it's composting, recycling facility, or tra transfer station, all of them have a public opposition, but uh, severe public opposition. But when it comes to waste to energy and landfills, uh, the opposition does peak, which is why we're really interested in how. ISFAG um, uh, deals with it, how it engages with them and how uh, with the community and how it builds that uh, very important trust um, with them. So um, ISFAG um, is already operating a plant in um, the city of Antwerp and it treats uh, the residual waste from about 1 million people. And um, they are currently, uh, and this plant in its early stages um, had, had public opposition, but um, ISFAG, um, I, I, right now, I think Iswag and the, the community are good neighbors. Um, they've uh, gone through this. They've mm -hmm. been very transparent. And uh, Iswag is right now investigating a new plant in the same location um, uh, next to the existing plant. Um, and once the new plant, uh, and the plan is once a new plant is constructed, the old plant will be decommissioned and the new plant would be much more efficient. It will also generate uh, heat and electricity. And the new mm -hmm. plant only generates, uh, the old plant only generates electricity at this point. So um, so let me um, begin with my questions for Crystal and then uh, so and then we'll take it from there. So uh, hi Crystal, thank you very much um, for joining us today. Hi Ranjit, thank you for the invitation. No problem. All right, so um, well uh, let me start with my first question. Now um, it is said that good companies always uh, get a license to operate even in tough projects. Yes all others will always struggle even in easy projects and when it comes to iswa you got your license to operate for your current plan so what do you think um the others are missing i think we have to be reluctant for generalization being what you call a company is not enough it's not sufficient in the 90s iswa was a good company and we were respecting all the regulations Nevertheless, we ended up in a crisis situation with our neighborhood. Regulation and emotions are two different things. Even when your company does better than the reg regulations prescribed, even though you have to take care of public acceptance and be aware of public acceptance. Um, even for a good company in waste management, there is no such a thing as an easy project. For ISFAC, getting our license uh, to operate the current plant was not an easy walk in the park. And even today, we have to earn it every day over and over again. What helped us a lot during the project over the past year is um, complete transparency and getting into a dialogue. We have, for example, more than 5,000 visitors visiting our plant every year again. Informing people is good, but 
talking to people and listening to their concern is much better. So it's not uh, efficient when you only give information, you have to listen to what they say or want to say. Every single question I find gets a question. When they uh, phone us, when they send us an email, we try to respond uh, the same day as soon as possible. Uh, what we also do is putting our story in a broader local perspective. It's not just our plans. We are a part of a complete story, and the story is a circular economy in which you always need a fallout where you need to sink. Some products are not able to be recycled, reused. They are end of lifetime, and there we are the solution. What we always say, it's about people's waste. It's not our waste. They bring their waste to our plant and we treat the waste. We are a solution, we are not the problem. We try to put it in a, a broader local perspective, but also in a broader international perspective. We are a local player, we are an intermunicipal organization, but even though we take initiatives on international level, by setting up collaborations and uh, because we want to exchange knowledge, knowledge and best practices. Uh, we advise communities when they ask us. We go to cities and uh, to learn how they work, how they uh, get on with the project, uh, where we can learn. It helps us to get better knowledge and to get awareness about latest developments and it helps us also to define our exact role and position in our sector and in debates. We try to refer to situations not only in Belgium, not only in Antwerp, but good and bad situations we have seen in other countries. I don't hear you anymore. Sorry, um, no, thank you, I muted myself. So. Um, all right, so um, we know ISWAG had um, public opposition in the end, and you actually say that you have to do this um, every day. Um, you know, it's not a one-time effort. So, um, so considering that throughout ISWAG, you know, what was the biggest crisis you faced with the community, and you know, how, what steps did you take? How did you overcome um, that? Um, it was in the late 90s, there was in Belgium a dietary crisis and our neighbors started up a legal procedure against ISFA. We had protesters in front of the gate um, and people wanted to close down ISFA. And at that, at that point we made an uh, analysis of what we did wrong and we saw that there was a problem with our communication. Each year we published, we published a technical report because we were obliged by legislation, but that was it. So that's what I said before, we didn't listen to what people wanted, the information they wanted from us, we just handed over the technical report. Now we saw that we had to set up a communication with our neighbors, but you can ask how you set up a good understanding with, at that point, your words opponent. We started a dialogue, but I mean a real dialogue. And in that communication, um, we showed recognition and respect for the real stakeholders. We took our time. You don't want to rush, take one step at a time, but because you don't have to convince people that you're absolutely right and that they're wrong. It's about mutual understanding. It's about showing respect for each other's opinion. And that's what we do, do since the 90s. Um, uh, that's very interesting because um, these days all public dialogues are very hyperbolic. You know, everyone talks about the extremes and there isn't much respect for each other. And um, mm -hmm. I think one of the things that I um, frequently observe is that um, uh, experts or uh, practitioners from one field consider all others to be ignorant of mm -hmm. you know, that field and therefore consider them to be ignorant um, in general. But then they don't really um, recognize the fact that um, recognize the fact that the other people are experts in something else and then you know they have that expertise and and that all of us are trying to learn 
knowledge in a specific domain and therefore you know becoming better at that domain but maybe we not know much about others therefore whenever we're talking to others we have to make it much more simpler for them to understand yeah. uh, a basic um for them to understand what we're talking about you know to make sure yeah. they also what's happening um all right so um coming to my next question so uh what should a project developer or a community stakeholder remember when navigating discourses on health risk facility need trust and environmental justice i'm asking this question because uh you know uh these uh, discussions are happening worldwide you know when a new project you know should happen these discussions happen but then um in those discussions uh they quickly get really heated and then you know um neither the community gets what it wants or neither the stakeholder uh, the project developer gets uh, uh, what he he or she wants uh, and therefore you know what should both sides be aware of and what should be what should they folk remember when you know navigating discourses on health risk or facility need for the facility or environmental justice the problem is that uh, in the communication in the communication you mostly start from the conclusion and the conclusion is clear for the decision maker but not for public opinion so we have developed a motivation a reasoning why we concluded that our plan is relevant why our plan is necessary and why our plan is the best option based on all the parameters technology mobility economic economy demographics but also legislation and over the past year we learned that everything is relevant there's not uh, such a thing as uh, technology is more relevant than a mobility it's all even uh, it's all the same it's all relevant it depends on the specific stakeholder what he or he or she thinks it's relevant or our motto is there always that total transparency meaning that very every every very questions get an answer we don't look to who is asking these questions we say every question is relevant and give an answer to that before we enter in a meeting with stakeholders, for example, a uh, local community, we agree on the agenda and we ask to get as many topics, questions or remarks in advance. So we can prepare ourselves or even invite external experts on specific matters to join us for the meeting. So we can, can give clear information, objective information, not only conclusions who are coming from ourselves. Right. Okay. And um, so another question is, um, so certain studies support the idea that um, it's not just technical knowledge deficits on the part of the residents that is at the root cause of opposition. Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, when so someone's opposing a plant, it doesn't just mean that they're not aware of the technical um, know-how, but um, I think the, the problem, so certain studies say that the problem is prioritizing of different values by both the proponents and opponents. So um, when it comes to values, you know, um, uh, what's your experience and, you know, you know, what kind of values do you think fall on one side or the other and their prior priorities? And it's about mutual understanding and mutual respect and willing to listen to each other. It's not about absolutely wanting to convince the other that you're right and that they're wrong. It's our job to explain to people in clear, understandable, understandable language what is going on at uh, our plant. For example, we have to respect emission values. We do much better than the emission values, but people doesn't understand what this actually means. We talk about nanograms and milligrams per cubic meter. So uh, we went to the University of Antwerp and we asked uh, the professors there to make a study on uh, how our emissions relate to other sources that people know in their everyday life. How do our emissions compare to the emissions of cars, of households, and based on this information, we produced a little brochure 
and I have it here, I don't know if you can see it, with some clear illustrations, and that makes the comparison between um, car household and the emissions of this fire. Maybe you could put that closer to the screen. Um, the, yeah. Yeah. But it's, oh, but it's in, um, it's in Dutch. So. Oh. <laughs> well, maybe it's, in, Dutch it's an idea to make some translation. Right, yeah, <laughs> and that's the Dutch viewers, I guess. So, uh, all right, great. Um, so um, earlier, when we were talking before the um, this recording, um, and when we were talking about Iswag being good neighbors um, with the community, yeah. you, you know, um, you had uh, so you you were not co completely um, convinced with that. So, um, do you want to talk about that? Do I want to talk? I didn't hear your question, Annabel. Uh, I'm sorry. So, uh, when we were talking earlier before the recording about um, yeah. uh, Iswag and the community. Um, and um, you said that certain uh, uh, people in the community uh, could not be uh, completely convinced about uh, you know what you're doing and um, your transparency. So do you want to talk about that? I mean, how do you deal with you know that kind of people, uh, that that kind of groups of people? We don't ignore them. Um, we invite, them. we ask them to come over to see with their own eyes what happens here at our plant, um, but we don't try to convince them. We talk to them, we listen to their arguments. Mostly it's a pure emotional debate, um, and, and that's very difficult to give answers to those people's, people because they, we can't say what we want to hear. They only want us to close down, and maybe they think that the green parts are taking over the installation, but that's not when we have to close down, something else appears here on this plan. So uh, it's a very difficult communication, but we try to uh, take time for uh, this communication to listen to what their remarks are. Um, and we keep investigate, investigate uh, questions when they ask question we don't have always the answer and then we go uh, we're looking for experts to um, give us uh, scientific information to help us uh, create answers create answers give answers to people and, and and give answers to their questions and and the little pocket I have is is an example of um, some of these answers okay all right and um, so let me remind the viewers that um, this is a recorded version of uh, um, interview with um, Crystal uh, from Ms. Park. Um And um, so, and you can um, tweet about this uh, by using the hashtag Waste Dialogue. Um, and of course, um, all of the recordings will be available um, after, um, after the Global Dialogue on Waste. So follow us on social media or subscribe to our monthly newsletter and then you'll, you'll, you'll get all the recordings uh, for future reference. So, all right, great. So, um, oh, thank you, Crystal. So, um, so now uh, talking about uh, these people who do not um, completely, are not completely convinced, do you think um, they are just prioritizing different values than, you know, what others are prioritizing? You know, this is one of the questions that, you know, we had earlier. Do you think they're just prioritizing different values? Um, um, I don't, I, I'm not sure. It's very difficult to give an answer on that. I think they, they see other pictures. They see us as a problem. And um, there where we say that we're not a problem, they um, can give some solution to the problem they see when they go to the shop go to the supermarket and and they uh, they put waste into their um, their, their supermarkets because they are buying packaging and and packaging is after using it is waste so that's something where we work on and and invite people here and tell them how they have to avoid waste how they have to recycle and we only treat the part that it's not recyclable 
Right, right. Okay, all right. And um, so when it comes to the current investigation for a new plant, um, how, how is that going? You know, um, what are you doing there? Yeah, we're uh, still uh, investigating with expert, but um, we have to invite people and uh, we'll do that on a neighbor's day. And we'll do that next month. Uh, we invite them to come over to the plant and we'll tell them about our plants. We inform them about the objectives we set ourselves, lower emissions, more efficient on producing electricity, producing heat, uh, so we invite them and we tell them ourselves they don't have to listen to uh, read it in the newspapers, uh, they don't have to see it on the news, we ask them to come over and tell it uh, to them in person. Okay, all right. And um, going back to the uh, problem that you had in, uh, in the 90s, so what was the context, you know, what do you think led to that problem um, then? Was was there any historical um, reasons for that? Um, because I know you were talking about the dioxins crisis in the 90s. Yes, but um, there was no, not an historical reason, it just di dioxin crisis appeared and then uh, there was new legislation and we have to lower the emission, we have to uh, build a new park on the plant on the uh, the treatment of the gas flow, uh, gas flow key. Um, so it was more uh, a problem of, of uh, communication. We were the emissions were okay, and uh, but people didn't know what was happening over here. They saw our installation. They saw saw the stack. Uh, smoke was coming out of the stack, and they were thinking, "Oh, that's part of the crisis." So um, we, we opened our doors and invite them in and, and to see with their own eyes what was happening over here, how we were operating the plant. Um, we put our emissions on our website so people can see every day uh, what uh, are the emissions of the installation. I think we, were, were, we are one of the only installations in Belgium who, do, who does that. So you can follow all the emissions on, uh, on the screen. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so um, another question is: um, so you you publish the emissions or uh, regularly? Um, how does that work? How does that work? Um, the regular uh, sorry, not the regulations, but the emissions. Um, yes. Do you, uh, how do you communicate the emissions to the public? Are they published regularly? And yes, each day you can uh, see the new um, the emissions of the day before on the website. Uh, uh, direct link between uh, the installation and the website. Okay, and uh, since you started that, you know, what kind of reactions did you get um, to doing this? Most of the people say, uh, we know there's not a problem at this fact, everything is okay, we, uh, we know that coming out of the stack, it's clear, it's, it's, it's water. Um, so that's a, a way to convince people and that's what I say, the transparency, we, we uh, think that's very important. Mm -hmm. and, Show people uh, what you do. Yeah, yeah. And I think, um, uh, since you're mentioning transparency, I think transparency is really um, a problem in um, developing countries these days when it comes to waste management infrastructure. Um, they don't seem to be too transparent and, um, you know, no community engagement whatsoever. So um, they're also um, uh, facing uh, more public opposition. Mm -hmm. I mean, they plant, uh, I think the first successful plant in India, mm -hmm. uh, which is in Delhi, um, and they had no community engagement and then community doesn't know what can the emissions come out of it, or um, even if they do, I mean, they can't believe in it. Um, so mm -hmm. there's a lot of transparency there. So uh, for someone, who's already gone through this um, uh, path of no transparency for a while, uh, you know, what do you, what kind of suggestions do you have um, to such operators? I think you have to show people what's in for them. Um, you have to listen to people. And for example, there's a problem with uh, water cleaning or 
and maybe you can treat the water of a, a river nearby the installation in, in your plant and, and um, together with the waste, uh, with the treatment of the waste. So we have to look for mutual goals and see what's in for, for uh, the developers, but also what's in for the neighbors, for the stakeholders. Right, right, okay. Um, and so what are the most frequently asked questions for you at the, at the plant when someone comes there, you know, what are they concerned about most? Uh, not, they're not concerned about the thing. They ask, why are you located here? Why oh. don't you go to the harbor? Um, yeah. um, that's a, the question we have the most. Why are you mm. located here nearby the city? But mm. uh, that's something about transport. When you're nearby the city, you're nearby the, the place where the waste is produced. So you don't have to drive long distance with the waste. And mm. in return, you can give uh, electricity and heat, uh, district heating to the neighborhood. And mm. that's not possible when you're uh, far away from uh, the city center. Right, right. But um, then, even if you're yeah. in the harbor, you could give electricity there, right? Yeah, but, but in the harbor, there are lots of uh, installations who can do steam. So they have the heat, they have the, the, the capacity to deliver heat to each other, but, but they, they're not interested yet. Right, right. Okay, okay. All right. Um, and... Um, Okay, and um, so now when it comes to location, um, you know, the I, I mean, we always have to, I think, talk about the not in my backyard, um, mm -hmm. you know, phenomena. And um, so, and it's also very interrelated with environmental justice, you know, at least in the US. Um, we see that uh, waste handling facilities are built in low income neighborhoods. Um, and um, so, how do you deal with those issues, you know, with the environmental justice issue, which is, you know, very um, I think important. that's not comparable in Belgium. Uh, you see okay. the ability of a uh, smaller uh, installation um, nearby the city centers. You see it also in Scandinavian countries uh, where they build smaller installations as, a, as an energy hub who gives uh, use the waste as a material and give back electricity and, and heat that's produced by using the waste as a material instead of fossil fuels. Right, right. Okay, okay. And um, all right. Okay. And um, so what are your future plans with uh, with the plant right now and uh, with the upcoming, uh, well, the investigation for, for the new plant? Uh, we hope we'll have a permit in uh, mid 2018, and we can start the, uh, the um, process to, to building up the new plant. When it's finished, and that must be in 2022, then um, and after commissioning the new plant, we will um, close down the old installation. I call it mm. the old installation, but it's the existing installation because it's in in, in new state. But uh, the new one will be more. Uh, energy effective and, and will have lower, even low emissions than the existing plant. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. And um, so mid 2018, so um, this seems to be a very um, lengthy permitting process. Um, yeah. Would you suggest something like this for developing countries? Oh, it, it takes a long time because there's a public investigation. We right. have uh, to put our plans online and go to tell people about our plans and they can give their suggestions and their comments on our plans. So we have to respond to the to these comments. That's why it takes a very long period. Okay. okay. All other stakeholders, um, like the city of Antwerp, um, and, and can take part of that uh, investigation. Mm -hmm. This actually uh, reminds me of uh, my conversation with um, Philip once. I mean, he was telling me about how um, uh, there were people. Uh, there was an old woman who um, saw uh, 
emissions coming from the plant and then she wanted to find out what it was i mean uh, and then you took her to the place and then you showed that it was a men's bathroom and it was just steam coming out of there so um yeah. that kind of um stayed with me um so uh, yeah that's uh, all about communication people see things and and make some conclusions and and sometimes they're wrong so you can only convince them by bringing them in invite them in and show them what is happening over here right. how do we treat their waste right and um do you have any such experiences i mean uh with people um with respect to uh, you know communicating with them um their questions or when people uh, understand that, that you want to listen to their concern it's all uh, very respectful so i don't I never had any problems uh, of people. Um, it was never so that that we had to close down the the conversation because of of, of the attitude of the of the opponent. So it's that's when you go in debate. You can discuss about things, but you have to respect each other. Right. Okay. And um, are there any um, final comments um, that you have? We have another 10 minutes. So um, are there any final comments that you would like to talk about, you know, when it comes to um, engaging uh, the communities from the very beginning or when it comes to building the trust? Um, as I said, we you have to work step by step. In Flanders, um, we have built up a lot of experience in uh, setting up waste management, we started in the in the, in the 70s, set up a waste management, and it took us over 30 years to get where we are now. So mm -hmm. uh, you have to take your time, and you don't have uh, to look to the results of Flanders and want them uh, in a very quick period because that's um, that's not possible. You have to analyze the situation and every situation is different. And when we can help, we always offer to help. So when people have questions, they can contact us um, and we see what we can do. Right, and um, this is one of the um, issues we, um, I work quite a bit in developing countries and this is one of the issues mm -hmm. that we face, um, face there is, um, so, everyone looks at the final result and maybe like Austria or Belgium or the Scandinavian countries and says, oh, they're doing so much higher recycling, but we are not doing that much higher recycling. So we should get there as the, you know, um, as they just look at the recycling part and then they just say we should get there. But then they don't really see that this is all possible because of proper sanitary landfills coming first, yeah. and, you know, waste to energy coming first and then simultaneously, you know, the, uh, public education and, uh, you know, recycling increase. So they don't really um, see that. So do you, what's your experience with respect to the evolution, the step-by-step -step evolution? I think um, you have to set up first the public education. That's why we have school children uh, come over to visit ISPAC and we tell them that we are the end of the whole uh, circulate system that uh, they have to recycle and reuse first before they throw things away. But uh, in India, for example, you have not uh, organized as we have, but you have the same system. People are keeping the streets clean by getting out those things who are valuable and, and they can sell again. So you have to start from what's able here and, and how you can set up um, a waste management system. But adapted to uh, the local situation you can just it's not if it's not possible to copy our uh, waste management system system and bring it over to india and say this is the solution you have to start from below right uh, we have to uh, start from scratch and you know um, go through this um, step yes. okay that makes sense um all right so um and uh, so in the global dialogue, which will happen next, but 
uh, with when it comes to um, broadcasting, this video will come after the global dialogue. Um, you know, most of the global dialogue happens. Uh, a global dialogue on waste happens. So, uh, in the first theme, we are discussing about um, going beyond a circular economy, and there mm -hmm. we have um, Robert Crocker, an author uh, of a book called Somebody Else's Problem, and there he talks about how building infrastructure kind of locks us in into certain behaviors even though you know consumers can do um, a lot more so and uh, given that waste to energy um uh, plants are also an infrastructure and they're mm -hmm. also long-term infrastructure so uh, what kind of precautions do you take to make sure that it doesn't lock the system into uh, a certain pathway but i don't agree with, with uh, his conclusion because okay. um and Belgium people have to pay for uh, treating their waste. They have to pay for bringing over the waste to the waste incineration plant. So when you have to pay from for something, uh, you don't set up a, a, a system you can't avoid. So I don't agree. But, uh, but that would be similar with um, roads where you have to pay tolls, right? I mean, so... That's Rick? Sorry, <laughs> I didn't hear you well. Oh, okay, so but that's similar to um, building roads where you have to pay tolls. Yes. I mean, it, it's similar, but um, don't you think his argument still stands that you know maybe um, building a plant with a certain scale will lead to um, you know uh, locking the city into a certain you know pathway? Yes, but it's different at, at ISPAN because we only do waste of uh, our stakeholders, okay. uh, our shareholders, mm -hmm. and that are the communities. We don't go um, to to the market to see is there industrial waste or commercial waste we can take in and we can treat here in our plant. We're just a small plant and we only treat uh, the household waste of our uh, stakeholders of mm -hmm. our shareholders, the communities. So I think that's a, a little bit different. OK, so you did consider um, the long term projections for waste management, the, the residual waste, and then uh, um, built or are building uh, the scale of the future plant. Yeah. OK, OK, all right, wonderful. Um, great, so um, thank you very much, Crystal. And uh, so um, uh, friends, um, thank you very much for uh, viewing this. And based on this discussion, what we see is, uh, you know, when it comes to waste management infrastructure, we have to start from uh, step by step and evolve. And when it comes to building a waste management plan, a waste handling plant or a waste energy plant, uh, we have to um, be very transparent and um, engage with people in a very respectful manner from the very beginning. Um, and um, this is extremely important um, because uh, in countries where uh, improper waste management affects public health, um, it's important that every project or every step that we take, uh, uh, it's important for us to make sure that it is successful. Otherwise, when mm -hmm. if a project like that fails, then uh, you know we've lost the opportunity. Um, to make change, and we'll have to wait many more years for some something similar to come up. So um, it's, I think, um, extremely important from a public service point of view for uh, even project developers to make sure that the, you know not just for the profit, but also for the public service point of view to make sure that the project you know comes to fruition. Um, so with this, um, I think we'll end this um, interview. And uh, thank you very much to Crystal for joining and for t for her time. So uh, thank you guys, and uh, please um, share uh, and please subscribe to us, and uh, that'll really help us uh, uh, get this knowledge to more people worldwide. Thank you, Crystal. Thank you, Ranjit. Bye.